Sassy Jack Stitchery is proud to be a sponsor of Fiber Talk. We so appreciate all the wonderful new things we learn, the familiar friends we meet online, and the fabulously talented artists that Gary and team introduce us to each week. Sassy Jack Stitchery is turning five next year. We opened our brick and mortar shop in 2017, and we are ramping up for a fabulous year of celebration in 2022. We'll be sharing more of our birthday plans with you as we work our way through the fall and navigate moving into our new shop home in our beautiful old 1878 Folk Victorian. We plan to be in our new shop home in Whitfin, North Carolina, just a few miles up the same street as our old shop before the year is out. We're hoping to have that beautiful old house decorated for Christmas in late November and time to share our holiday joy and our hope for the new year with all of you. In the meantime, we are rich in linens and threads and charts and notions, all ready to wing their way to your own little stitching nest just in time for cooler weather. You can find us on our website at sassyjackstitchery.com and keep up with us on our social media on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Thank you for your continued support of our shop and of this wonderful gathering place we know as Fiber Talk. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week from MAK Designs, Margaret Kinsey. Margaret, welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Uh, so glad to have you, and looking forward to this conversation. When I was uh, preparing, doing the research, and you do get studied rather thoroughly before we do these, <laughs> uh, it occurred to me, you know, there there is a decent handful probably two handfuls of people like you who have been doing this needlework, uh, stitching, design, research, all those things at a very high level for a very long time. What What is it that keeps you going? What What drives you and keeps you from just showing up one day and saying, eh, I'm done with it, I'm tired of it? Well, I think it's... Um... There's something in, in, in your soul that says you really need to do this. And um, I wake up sometimes with an idea in my, my head. Um, sometimes it's a flower in the yard or someplace where I've been. Um, architecture. Uh, there are so many inspiring things that makes a person want to not necessarily copy, but do your thing with that particular motif whatever it is so so that inspiration is just ingrained in you you as you go yes. through your days you're just seeing needlework things everywhere yes <laughs> well. a fabric with a pretty design on it uh, museums my goodness um, little tiny little things in a magazine may be something that will spur you I spent um, every Wednesday during um, the COVID uh, pandemic, when it was really bad here, um, doing a Zentangle every Wednesday. It was just a small thing, but it was so inspiring. And I've had two or three designs that just popped in my head after I played with, with the um, Zentangle designs. So it, it's just amazing where inspiration comes from. Yeah. And you still, uh, still. I mean, you 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 love obviously love doing it. Do you? Yes. Uh, do you? In your own personal stitching, your I'm doing this for fun stitching. Uh, you always itching to get to that. Is it? Is the drive that strong? Oh yes, oh yes. Um, and that little, um, I, I I'm sure you saw the pieces at for next year's seminar yes. at uh, the little. Bonsai is actually something that was only mine, and I said, I'll never teach this. And then I wanted one more gold work piece for um, proposal time last year. And I said, well, I'll put that in. Well, wouldn't you know, that's the one they took. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a garden of little, little bonsai trees, so... Um, they inspire me as well as lots of other things. But yeah, that, that one I never thought they would take. <laughs> and of course, that's the one they did. Yeah, yeah, well, that's... <laughs> and yeah, and that's... that was for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> that's the way it works every time. Yeah, that's the way it works. Yeah. What, now you start you start very young needlework. Oh yes, I was like eight years old probably. Uh, my mother embroidered. Uh, my grandmother quilted and crocheted. I have a magnificent bedspread that she made for me when I first married. Um, my great-grandmother quilted and lived next door. So there were all of these people dealing with fabric um, as I grew up, and it just became second nature to me. So it, yeah, it, so it was it was part of the wallpaper. It was just part of oh, your environment. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I learned to sew early, uh, clothing, mm -hmm. and still like to do that. Oh, you so, do? Uh huh. Oh yeah. yeah. Now learn learn to sew, meaning your mother sat you down and said, "You need to know how to do this. I'm going to teach you," or you went to your mother and said, "Show me how this happens." I said, show me how this happens, and I learned on my grandmother's threadle. And I only stitched my finger once <laughs> as a little kid. So, you know, it was it was just there. Everything was there. Yeah. Now, was it an artistic approach or a functional approach? In the beginning, it was probably more functional, but I had my, my grandmother and my mother both. Um, I, I grew up in, in the rural south. And good girls weren't supposed to go hang out. <laughs> so they said, busy hands are, the, uh, are what you should have. So I was taught early to stitch. And the summers were spent in the shade on the uh, big front porch stitching. Mm. Cross stitch? No, surface work. Oh, I never learned to cross stitch until I joined EGA. Really? Because <laughs> <laughs> for for many for I many that's the starting point. So oh, so that was yeah. that came much later then. Oh my. Oh yes. Oh yes. I was. Well, I think I joined in 1974, 75. Uh huh. So. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first year of college. That's the more. <laughs> That's yeah. a, that's a lot of years. So it uh as as you going through are do you pick up on on design and start to drive yourself to advance your skills or was it a lot of years of just doing it because you enjoyed it and then then something triggered? Yes, it was many years of I guess mastering the techniques um and Silk and metal is not much different than other surface embroidery. There's a lot of couching and satin stitches and and that sort of uh, embroidery. Um, you just working with metals. And when I had my first class with my first silk and metal teacher was Elsa Coast, and she was from New Jersey, and I just loved her. And if she was anywhere near, I took her classes. <laughs> so. Um, when I found silk and metal, I never looked back. <laughs> oh, so that was the that that so she she exposed you and yes, you latched onto that whole world. Yep. Uh, oh, okay. I did, and and in the old days there weren't very many books. There was an ecclesiastical book, and it had some stuff in it, and it was really your own reading that and trying to decipher what what they really wanted to do because there weren't very many photographs or anything like that in those early books yeah. and drawings and things like that yeah so uh, it was and getting supplies was oh, yeah you i'll know, bet you that you had to yeah. find somebody <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll bet that was a huge challenge yes well it really was and i we had a local needlework shop i lived in new canaan connecticut and it was called the yarn tree and she, I already had my oldest daughter was learning to stitch as well as my younger daughter, Kate, who is now a certified teacher, but they, you know, they were working with wool and linen. And so I went down and said, Oh, well, let me see what I can find in gold thread. So I got one of those knitted, um, uh, knitting threads that is like a chain. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't work. So I really had to wait until I found a teacher. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Tap tap into that vein. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. 
Well, as a mother, that's got to be got to really feel good, be gratifying that your daughters. Yes, it really is. Yeah. Um, I'm very thrilled. Uh, my oldest daughter loves beating now, and the younger one is the one that's probably going to take over my stash when I <laughs> leave this world. <laughs> but, hey. good, good to know it's going to somebody somebody who will appreciate it. That's uh, oh yes, that's let's hope thing. so. Yeah. <laughs> so that so that means family gatherings, uh, needles and thread are flying everywhere. Yes, usually. Yeah. <laughs> Leaves the sun out a little bit, but uh, that's okay. Yeah. His well. wife, his wife knits, so. Oh, okay. And I did give him a sewing machine when he left home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, that's great when it's like that. It, it just threw the whole family like that. Yeah. Yep. So you so you you get into silk and metal threads and basically sounds like you're teaching yourself to some degree to to perfect these techniques basically uh yes i i i did um once once i was able to get the supplies and uh, and as i said we lived in connecticut so elsa coast was around quite a lot in the old days and she would come teach us new stuff and then we had other teachers um in the in those old days, there were lots of traveling teachers, and we had teachers from California and all around the country to come to teach us. Um, today, it's a little, everybody likes to teach, and we all like to travel, but uh, don't go to as many chapters as we used to. Yeah. It's more seminars and things now. Yeah. How did the, as the internet came along, I mean, you, you and I both were, uh, alive and functioning as in the very early days of the internet. Yeah. And, uh, how did, did you embrace that early on or was that something that you just took a wait and see on? Um, I, in the beginning, well, I also was working 40 hours a week at one point and, um, I still stitched. I made my daughter's wedding dress and embroidered, um, shirts for the girls that were in her wedding party and that sort of thing. And I didn't do much until I finally retired from that. And I guess I was, was probably 10 years into it before I really got, but got deeply involved. And it's still hard for me for whatever reason. I, I loved my old typewriter and it took me it took it breaking before I would really sit down and accept the computer. <laughs> but now, <laughs> now I wouldn't think of going back. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. The typewriter. That's what uh, my early work years were as a magazine editor with a typewriter. I used to be able to type really fast and really well. And <laughs> yes. Now I hit yes. that delete key so fast. It makes your, it makes your head spin. Yeah. Oh, I know. But I, I told my husband once, I said, you know, if I had had this computer when I was in school, I would still be in school. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. everything's at your fingertip. Right. Right. All, yeah. all you have to do is say, I need some paper bobbins and Amazon has them. <laughs> yep. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh yeah, there's a lot oh. of pluses, no doubt about it. And well, it's it's changed needlework in a lot of oh, very positive ways. I mean, it's opened doors for so many people. It certainly has, and I'm thrilled about that because I think it's to me, my my daughter said to me once, "Well, I am um so excited um, now I know why you stitched so much mm. when we were kids." And she said, "I resented it." But I said, well, I didn't have any um, psychiat psychiatrist bills <laughs> <laughs> because I had three children pretty close together, so uh, I was busy. Yeah, yeah. So, so when you got a half hour to stitch, it was like it was heaven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, release. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, man. Little smock dresses and all kinds of good things for the children. So. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's interesting. They resent it a little bit, but then uh, as they get older, appreciate it, and now are doing it full tilt. So, yeah, she yeah. says, and now I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You see the, yeah, the uh, wisdom of age. Wisdom of yes. age. Yep. Yeah. So, all right. So, take me through now. Uh, a silk and metal. You're learning that. Mm-hmm. How much uh, do you did you do of did or or are you doing with Japanese embroidery? You know the the full blown. Oh uh, yeah, I'm certified you... to I'm certified to teach that, and I do um, I do have students, um, two very excellent students at the moment. Um, I started that my. My friend Elsa Co said, Margaret, um, the Tamuras are coming, and I want you in the class. So, <laughs> so I went, and I thought, oh well, one one class. Well, I got hooked. <laughs> so yes, it's wonderful. Well, to me, that of of all the needlework. And you know, I probably make some enemies saying this, but to me, that is the most impressive. Is that series of levels and people who accomplish that? Uh, the commitment. I guess it's the commitment to perfection. It's commitment. It's commitment, and and you do strive for perfection. There is no doubt about it. And when you look at your work, you can see the improvement from one one phase to the next. It's just. Um, but you have to be dedicated. You cannot yeah. <laughs> pick it up and lay it down and pick it up and lay it down. Yeah, that's that's what's always stopped me is is having the, the time to focus. Yes. Yeah. So when when you're doing each of those levels then, even though to us with untrained eyes it all looks perfect, to yes. you to you there is very definite progression. Oh, yes. And uh, I have been known to spend two days stitching on a piece and then on the third day go in and look at it and say, this is all wrong and oh. cut it out. Oh, no. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's that kind of thing. You become very critical of your own work. Um, but that, um, what, what do we want to call it? That practice of Japanese embroidery has made my work much better. Mm -hmm. I did a name tag and then I remarried and had to do a name tag a second time. And I used the same little motif. And the next, the second one was so much better than the first one that it was like two people had stitched it. <laughs> so uh, it's, it is really and truly a discipline. And I tell people that, and you, if you're going to do it, you must be committed. You just can't play at it. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, yeah. Like I said, that's what stops me every time is, is that the time to commit and to focus on, uh, on the perfection that's, that's needed. But, right. Yeah. So, uh, a long time to accomplish all levels and, and be able to teach or were you able uh, to you um, I only missed one session and I made it up. They taught uh, in the old days when they were still living in Japan. They taught in New York City, or the New York environs, and ended up in Westchester, or in Dearborn, Michigan, because Shea Pendre lived in Dearborn and, and Elsa lived in New Jersey. So they had two sets, and then a, a, later they uh, had some classes um, the same thing out in California. So I was able to make up the one I missed by going to uh, De um, Detroit. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I went through the the program all the way to 10 and 11 and 12. And I have been going to teacher week ever since then. Um, I do have some of those that aren't finished, so I, oh. I have work to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, every, everything is in Atlanta now? Is that how it is? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there are occasional trips to Japan. I have never been with them to Japan. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
I'm almost too old now to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's it like working with those masters? Is it is it humbling or are, oh is, very yeah very I would have I always said wet fingers and sweaty armpits <laughs> and seemed to be threading a needle when they came by. <laughs> so, um, but it was oh it was to to be working with a. A, a different culture and in the old days we could not wear uh, have magnifying lamps like we have today oh we wore dresses we wore skirts um you were not allowed to speak unless you were spoken to um it was a different um not the chatty classrooms that we have sometimes today so yeah. so it's it's as much a cultural thing as it is needle art. Absolutely. Oh. And and their designs uh come from their culture. There was a period there've been several periods of time in Japan where the the country was closed off. And so they perfected their designs a lot during those periods and they also um have that native uh, religion, the Shinto, which is they don't believe that man can do can perfect anything as beautiful as is in nature. Mm. So you, you have that to um, to deal with when you're when you're working it. So most of the designs from the Japanese are very very stylized, whether it's rosashi or whether it's the Japanese um, surface embroidery. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. The the style, I I think that's probably what catches my eye every time is that that very peaceful, calming style that uh, right uh, is is in every one of them, no matter what the subject. It, it, absolutely, yeah. yeah, absolutely. They're they're beautiful, and originally it was for the kimono, and now that they don't wear kimono, they had to figure out that they had to be wall hangings and purses and belts and that sort of thing so that it still continues. It's got a 1700 year history. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, not many things do we know that have that. Right. Yeah. That would be an interesting study to see how something so old and and still today so intact in its origins has mm -hmm. evolved you know the, the slow painful evolution yeah well part of that was the isolation mm -hmm. which really kept a lot of things from being introduced there's more now um more influence now and there's even almost a realistic effect in in a lot of the new pieces that they're putting out. So, yeah. Now, how does the how does the des sorry, I'm just intensely curious about this whole thing. But how does the design part work? Is it, it do the masters from Japan come up with designs? Are you encouraged to do your own designs? How does that whole aspect it, work? It all comes from the masters uh um the my original Pieces were designed by Master Saedo, who was uh, Masa Tamura's father, and her brother now has the school in in Kurnakai, and um, the Tamuras brought it to this country. So, uh, but they uh, keep a traditional Japanese household. Ah, cling so to the old you ways. Go in, yeah. Yeah, when you go in, your shoes come off, and you wear their slippers, and you sit quietly, and it's 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 a wonderful meditative time mm -hmm. to be there. Yeah, that that was what I was going to say. It, it it seems kind of onerous, but uh, really is just, it seems it strikes me anyway as as just uh, stepping into another world of just peace and calm. It is. It yeah. is truly that. Yeah. It's uh, um, wonderful. Yeah. yeah and uh, living here in America, what a, 
what a nice contrast to our normal day of life. Yes. Yeah. And when you go there, I mean, the, there are big pine trees that are singing and, you know, it's just a wonderful, wonderful atmosphere to be in. Yeah. Now talk to, tell me about Rosashi until I <laughs> ran into you. I, I didn't even know this existed. And, and so when it comes to Japanese needlework, this looks like something a regular human can do. <laughs> I always tell my students uh, that if the Japanese uh, court women could do this, they certainly can. It is, um, uh, it's all, well, we call it Japanese needlepoint. They call it, you know, Rosashi and don't worry too much about it. It is, uh, it goes back to 700 A.D., and uh, in the Nara period, it is um, a court. It was the court ladies who did the work in the beginning. And of course, they would have done it because um, the common man couldn't afford or didn't have silk. Um, Mrs. Kunimitsu has said that it was one of the three major embroideries from China. But I have never seen a uh, row, which is um, has three bands, woven bands between the needle holes, and um, in any of my Japanese, uh, in any of my research that I've done, mm -hmm. it's just not come up. And I've talked with Dr. Young Chung in New York, and she's of the same opinion that she doesn't know. So we do know that it is worked on uh, row, which is the summer robe fabric. And we work on the three thread row, and there's a seven and there's a, a 11 wo woven. So there's little needle holes, or you could, and there's one irregular that you use the silks the silk thread is tightly twisted but it is filament silk mm -hmm. there is a thread that is um silk and me metal uh, it's now metallic because the price of gold is too much and there is a, a regular metallic gold silver those colors and then there's a thread called urushi which is the uh, the the outer coating, which is a paper coated, uh, it is a paper that's coated with the sap from the lacquer tree, hmm. and it makes the most beautiful um, colors when they add dye to it. It is just a gorgeous thread. It's fragile. It looks metallic. Um, it is wonderful to work with, and I found um, there was a magazine called Flying Needle many years ago, and it was the house organ for the National Standard Council of American Embroidery. And they had three articles over a series of a couple of years on, in it about Rosashi. And Maggie Bachman, whose husband was in the military, was stationed in Guam, I believe it was, and she went to uh, Tokyo and studied with Mrs. Kunimitsu um, in Rosashi. And so when he she came back to the States, uh, she began to teach it, and she traveled to Connecticut, and that's where I first had a, a class in it. Mm -hmm. and, it was um, very, I don't know, it's, talk about Zen. It is a Zen embroidery. I can do that at night, and I go to sleep and sleep all night. <laughs> it's just wonderful. So, so then a, a very, very different from traditional Japanese embroidery and or yes. gold work. Yes. Uh, it's stitched in hand in today in small frames you can have bigger frames and they still some some people in japan do it but there are japanese that have no idea about rosashi so oh. um, it was taught 
to a um, group of American ladies way in after the uh, in the when we were occupying Japan, mm -hmm. and they had a fashion show, and one lady did a a, a long skirt, a vest, and a belt, um, and the empress uh, asked went to see this show and asked to see if she could borrow it, and it came back about six weeks later with a wonderful thank you note saying how much she enjoyed seeing it. So um, that was probably the first group of Americans and foreign ladies that um, did it. Yeah. And my uh, teacher was Fumiko Ozaki, my sensei, and she came, her mother wanted her to come to America to see what the American ladies were doing. And we all fell in love with it, and and then when we started sending, I sent a piece back to be made into a purse, and she says, "Oh, the ladies can stitch." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yes, we can. <laughs> yes, we can. We can do it very well, <laughs> and and then uh, in its origins, it was the the court. And then when the samurai came along and occupied the ruler ruling groups, they those women also did it. So, um, and it's been woman to woman. There is no certification system. Um, it's just um, it's just an embroidery that, and it's still being taught person to person. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that's even written about it and it's not written there's a there's a pattern book from ancient times with 15 different stitches in it and that's it and oh. so mrs kuni mitsu's book um that she wrote shortly before her death is the one american book um, one book in america with one page in english and <laughs> if if we want to <laughs> yes <laughs> It's very interesting to to work with it. So yeah, well, I've had conversations with others about how needlework is much like music, in that yes. uh, the language barriers really don't matter. That's true. Yeah. Uh, the when I ordered this piece that turned into a purse, uh, not a written word came with it, but every area was had a, the beginning of the stitching in it. So mm. all I had to do was pick up my needle and, and follow what they had done. Uh huh. <laughs> so yep. that was, pretty, that was neat. <laughs> yeah. 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 Talk about and, the technique. I'm, I'm intrigued by the technique cause it seems like, uh, like anyone can pick it up, but then there's some, some specific materials like this ground cloth, this rogue ground cloth, uh, right. That, that you must use for this. Yes, that's true. Um, it is, um, everything comes from Japan. There is nothing here. There used to be seven um, different companies or individuals that made the row. There are now four. The threads are, were, um, and not necessarily so much anymore. Certain families would dye the silks. So there would be a green silk family and a blue silk family and blah, blah, blah. Uh, a little different now. Um, the threads are very twisted and t the silk is tightly twisted. The other threads are a little more fragile, the metals, and they're plied and soft twist. And you just have to work with them very carefully, the metals and all. The silk, you can just, we ping it and you put it between your thumb and forefinger and let it look like a jump rope and then jerk it and hear this little ping sound. And that's to keep the silk from knotting on itself. Mm. So it is that tightly twisted that it will make the nicest little knot you've ever tried to undo. <laughs> so uh, you're not very zen when that happens. No, no. no. <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll um, burst that little bubble. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So it's stitched in hand. There is always tension kept on the thread on the back and on the front. And th this form of Japanese embroidery likes needle holes. 
So you pull the needle hole open a little, uh, when, and then you come up most many times in that same needle hole uh, that you just went down in, um, or row, and so that opens the hole, and mm -hmm. you get, um, and the needle hole becomes a design element. So um, it's fascinating um, to do it. Um, they stitch it with a sharp needle. And I was originally taught to stitch with a tapestry needle. Uh -huh. uh, you're not as likely to grab the thread that's already in the hole if you have a tapestry needle. Otherwise, it's an oopsie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It snagged it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's always tension on it. You hold it in your hand. Um, if you have carpal tunnel or other arthritic problems, you can use um, a brace or a frame to uh, attach it to, but you still have to make sure that you're opening up the needle hole. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it, it is a fascinating ancient but new to us embroidery yeah now materials uh are, are you a source for materials or yes okay. yes i sell kits and i sell basic supplies and i normally have a table at merchandise night but i did not this year because everything has been so difficult to get you know at one point silk was not being allowed out of asia mm-hmm so directly out of Asia. So I had to find a source that would allow me to go through a third country. Oh, jeez. <laughs> to get supplies. <laughs> oh man. So, yeah. so even even you've been affected by this whole materials oh, yes. thing. Oh. Oh yes. Yeah. It's it's been crazy. Actually, um I got supplies better from from Asia than I have from some of the American suppliers. Mm. 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 So, uh, <laughs> yeah. but I have I've substituted even in the Japanese and the Rosashi because things just weren't available. Yeah. So so is this something where uh, threads that we normally use for needlepoint embroidery whatever that you you could accomplish nearly the same thing, or do you really need to have the the official threads? You, you need to have those threads. The closest thing that we have to Rosashi twisted silk is um, buttonhole twist. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's quite as tightly twisted as the uh, Rosashi thread. Oh, okay. So it's very tight then. Okay. It is really, really tight. Yeah. Now, is is, uh, is this Rosashi, is interest and, and the number of stitchers, is it growing? Uh, are there others teaching besides you? Uh, my daughter, Kate, uh, is going to teach two pieces next year at the seminar in uh, New York. Mm hmm And um, I was asked some time ago, who was my replacement? And I said, my daughter is learning. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. she will she will teach two pieces. And I looked at one of her pieces that she had designed, and she hadn't shown it to me. And I said, my God, that's my piece. So I guess the acorn doesn't fall very far from the tree. <laughs> yeah. It looked just like it was with my colors. You know, it was it was wonderful to see. I was really excited. Yeah, yeah, it feels good, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Now, yeah. is the are the designs as stylized as they are in uh, traditional Japanese embroidery? Oh, yes. And, in fact, there's a limit to what you can do with the Rosashi because... All of the stitches are upright, and so they compensating and that sort of thing is only over a one don. A don is that woven thing I was telling you about in the fabric. Um, and so you, when you're making a circle, you know you're 
putting it over two of these intersections or whatever, and then all of a sudden you've got this little box. Well, what are you going to do with the box? So you put a little ichi stitch, one, um, one Dawn stitch on each side or whatever. Um, so it's, um, what am I trying to say? It is uh, um, even more limiting. Mm-hmm. In, in design. So you have to make sure your designs are um, quite simple. And I think that's the first mistake that I made was trying to do more than, than the row would take. Oh, okay. So, uh, so you just you have, have to, to, you just have to accept that the vertical stitches limit you out of the gate and work with that. Yes. Don't, don't fight. Yes. It. Yes. That's very true. And um, it's my theory that Rosashi is probably the grandmother, I'm going to say, of Bargello. Oh. Because it's very similar in look to Bargello, but because it's an ancient technique, there's as little thread as possible on the back of the work. Hmm. So instead of wrapping your stitch over three or four threads you step back halfway into the last stitch and then go forward hmm to save thread yes to save thread <laughs> and so most ancient all of the laid work and that sort of thing that you see the bayou tapestry major bayou stitch is a laid stitch so when when it comes to metal silk Stitching, Rosacci, Japanese embroidery, where is your head at these days? What What is the one that comes to the surface for you? Well, I have pieces going in all three techniques. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. That answers that one. Yep. <laughs> you know, you, 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 you get stuck on a design and you say, well, I'll lay this down. And then you come back to it and things work. Um, I have a piece of Rosacci I'm working on. It's going to be a big peony, and I don't like the butterfly I put in it. I don't like its colors because it, I think it needs to be a little brighter. So I've sort of set it down until inspiration hits me till, till or a new thread. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Till it comes Sometimes back. Sometimes it just, yeah, it'll come back. <laughs> and the same is true. Metal. I've got a piece of silver going, and I like what I'm doing, but I just I, I had to set it aside. So we'll see. Now, and do I'm you... working on a dragon in Chinese and Japanese embroidery, and I've got a piece of Chinese embroidery going. So you know, I have quite a bit going on. <laughs> oh man! Wow! What fun! What fun! Now, do you have yeah. a do you have a studio at home there, a large space where you can spread all this out? And... Uh, yeah, well, it's it gets it encroaches on the rest of the house too. There, but there my husband, I, my husband, air conditioned uh, my, our double garage, and that's my studio. And we insulated it so we wouldn't be spending all of our money on Florida heat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding, yeah. So all right, so you're normal then. The needlework is, is yeah, it's everywhere. Everywhere, all right. yeah, but not in the bedroom. <laughs> oh, okay. There's a limit. All right. <laughs> There's a limit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Your husband, your husband, never show any interest. Oh, loves loves what I do. Oh, okay. And he's not interested in stitching. He's a wood carver. Oh, okay. So he does some beautiful wood carving. Um, he likes to do eggs and. They remind me of the the Gothic, uh, well, more of the Rococo churches in in Europe. They're so beautiful. They look like the the uh, tops of of the buildings. Yeah, yeah. So he has he has his own hand art. Then all right. Yes, yes. And he used to be a fly fisherman before we got too old. And so he can't complain about what my threads cost. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've reached an impasse. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Yep. Yes. 
Uh, so uh, what lies ahead for you? You're, you're teaching next year in New York at the EGA mm -hmm. uh, seminar. Uh, yes. Looking forward to getting out and teaching more as, as the pandemic allows, or are you working more uh, toward um, uh, online stuff? I'm doing both. I don't um, stitch. I don't uh, propose much to the regional seminars anymore. Um, you can just get too busy um, if you're not careful. So the older I get, the you know the harder it is to travel these days. Yes. So so uh, it there's a lot of online stuff. I've been I'm working on a piece that could be a a, a class over a series of months. It's just a matter of getting it all together. All, all the legwork to, to make it yeah, happen. Yeah. 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 And there's a Rosashi book that needs to be written. I was going so, to ask you if you were going to contribute to the limited supply there. I'm going to try. Um, I have an outline. I just now need time. So I'm beginning to say no to some of the volunteer things that I've done forever. <laughs> I have a book to write. Yeah. Yeah. That takes yeah. a lot of time just to, uh, just to get all the pieces together for the, for a book. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I've just done the outline. So it needs, needs, it needs to be filled out now. Yeah. Illustrations, photos, instructions, yeah. the whole bit. Yes. Yes. My husband is a wonderful photographer. And so he does most, the things I sent you were his work. Ah, well, they're, they're spot on. No doubt about it. Yep. Yeah, he's yeah. very good. Yep. Well, Margaret, thank you. This has been so much fun. It, oh, I've, uh, now i got to look into this Rosacci stuff here. This is um, intriguing. Okay. To me. Well, I'll have to send you a piece, or maybe you'd like to be a palette stitcher. Well, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I'll try about anything. So, um, okay. Yeah. I'm, well, let's see what we can do. <laughs> I'm, I'm a sucker for for a, for a new thing. So, yep. Every well, time. You, you, you will enjoy it. Um, the the ribbon piece I gave you, uh, in the photographs, I believe there's traditional ribbons or something like that's the name of it, is according to my sensei in 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 Japan, my best piece. Oh, so, okay. Okay, so I'll study that fun. one. Yep. Thank you for inviting me. I've certainly enjoyed it. All right, well, thank you, and thanks to everyone for listening. Mm -hmm.